Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Patrick. Hello. Uh, welcome to Belgrade, to HipCon. Thank you so much. I'm very um, happy to be here. coming from Microsoft, Microsoft. Yes, Microsoft. Yes. yes. Do we have a GitHub accounts now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everyone gets them for free. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. So tell me something. If I give you this mic, what would you be able to sing? Oh, God. Uh, the <laughs> thing I got famous for somewhat was when I was much younger, about two feet shorter and about 50 pounds heavier. I, okay. I did a talent show where I sang, I will survive. The, oh, I will survive. The, the disco, the I will survive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we know yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, continue. Won a talent, yeah, thank you. I won a talent show. Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I made one of the teachers pee themselves. They laughed so hard. Oh. So it was something about a short little white kid that's like really fat makes people laugh when they sing, I guess. I oh, know. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that must be an awesome experience, right? <laughs> it was fun, yeah, yeah. Okay, this time you will not sing, actually, but you will talk. No, and, that okay. you know of, I won't sing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe if you're lucky. Okay, rock on. Yeah, then. thank you See so you. much. Woo. All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Woo! My name is Patrick Kettner, as Igor was so kind to point out, and I am a program manager for Microsoft Edge. Do a mix. Hey, thank you. Uh, I do a little bit of standards work, some developer relations type stuff, and I just get to basically play on the internet all day. It's an awesome job. Uh, but I'm not here today to talk about Edge specifically. I'm here today to talk about JavaScript. Well, actually, a lack of JavaScript. Um, and this isn't a, a smash against JavaScript or anything like that. I love JavaScript. I've, I've been using it since the internet looks like this. If there's anybody that used this website, it was awesome back in the day. Um, I've been, since the very, very early days of the web, uh, I was lucky enough to grow up near Microsoft, and they kind of threw money at schools because Apple was trying to throw money at schools. And so we got all this really awesome hardware, and I got online at a really young age. And what's awesome about being able to join the internet at such a young age is that I kind of get to see it evolve over time. You know, I saw it go from these really early websites that were terrible that you should never look at the source code for <coughs> to, uh, you know, more dynamic interactions with DHTML that came out a few years later. Any DHTML people back in the day? No? Oh, come on. You're missing out. It was awesome. You got to have, like, scrolling text and everything. It was the best part of the Internet. Um, but obviously, you know, things continue to evolve. Eventually, we had standards-based stuff. Up until then, we had kind of browser wars. And so this was the Wired News redesign, which is the first major website that actually used web standards and CSS. It was a huge deal rather than, like, table layouts and stuff. It was a really big deal at the time. Um, and, you know, after standards work and we understood that you could actually build a real working website with standards, things got even better with probably responsive web design. That's nearly 10 years old now, if you can believe it, uh, where we you know, discovered that websites didn't have to be 960 pixels wide and nothing else. And you know, as the web continues to evolve, I think probably the most turning point moments that we've had in the recent past is probably the announcement of PWAs, the idea of offline application support inside of the browser. That's something that I, myself, and my team have been focused on for a couple of years now. And I really, really think that in the not too distant future, it's just going to kind of be table stakes. And when you're building a web app with uh, modern technologies, you're going to need it to be a PWA. It's just the expected user experience for what websites are actually going to be. And because we believe this so strongly, I end up spending a lot of my times when I work on the browser in websites like this. This is CodePen. It's a fantastic site. I'm sure a lot of you have used it before. And it's not the first of the type of website that it is. You know, it's really just a code scratch pad editor. There's been those for you know, 10, 15 years at this point. But the thing that made CodePen really revolutionary, at least for myself, was this little part right here. It says uh, SCSS next to the CSS. And the reason why that was so important was because CodePen was the first website I used, at least, that actually allowed you to use a preprocessor uh, inside of your code scratch pad. So in this case, it was using SAS. And SAS, of course, completely revolutionized the way that I think a lot of front-end development actually works. It's something that, to this day, nearly 10 years on, it is actually still influencing the way that CSS uh, specifications are written, and it's wonderful. And that's why I was so excited when CodePen shipped support for SAS, you know, where I can sh make all these quick little demos or show off my SAS plugins to my peers at the various agencies I was working at at the time, because, you know, you couldn't do that before. It, it was really, really, really difficult to share these experiences. And it's great. But when merging that with my love for PWAs and wanting kind of these offline experiences, like when I'm going on a plane to Serbia and trying to show off a demo, there's a problem. And that problem is this, it's Ruby. Uh, see, SAS is Ruby-based, and that really sucks if you're trying to make a web app work offline, because you can't, right? Like, in order to use a, a Ruby backend, you have to talk to the backend. You can't have a Ruby application running inside of a PWA. And then I realized that I get to play on the web all the time, and so I got to find a way to make that work. And I did with this project uh, I found. I didn't create, uh, but I found it called Opal. 
Opal is a really, really interesting project that's existed for a while now. And what it is is a Ruby to JavaScript transpiler. And so that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today is transpilers, how they work, and how they're going to affect web development over time. Uh, now, if you're unfamiliar with transpilers, you've that's fine, you've probably used them without even realizing it. The idea, in general, is that Opal will go over your Ruby code and then spit out JavaScript. That's it, right? It's just the process of taking one language or taking one style, whether it's TypeScript, where it's JavaScript-like, uh, C code and turning it into ASM, JS, or any of these other things. Those are all, uh, it's the, all the exact same type of a concept. And the way that all these different processes work come down to really the main three sections that we're gonna jump into real quick. Uh, there's lexing parsing, and code generation. These three things are the things that make all this code transformations actually work, and it's fundamental for how really programming languages work. And I am completely self-taught. I, I was a web developer, and I've been lucky enough to never go to college and got a good job anyway. So I didn't know any of this, so hopefully some of this is enlightening to y'all. But uh, the first step of this entire process is lexing. So what lexing is, uh, keep in mind when we first write our code, right? If you're typing in JavaScript or HTML or anything, there's nothing magical about the text that you're writing. It's just one big long string, right? The computer doesn't automatically know that, hey, it's a website just because you happen to put .html at the end of it. So what happens is that the, pro, uh, the browser has to do what's called lex. And what lexing is is actually breaking down that word, the entire string of your file, character by character, uh, you know, word by word, and figuring out all these different things that it thinks it already recognizes. So in this case, we're looking for, it notices that VAR is a keyword, and that's something that we know because JavaScript has that as a reserved space inside of the language. And it keeps going that character by character all the way through your file until it figures out that, okay, this is a valid lexing pr uh, program. That's great. Thing is though, this lexes, but, and it's valid, but it doesn't necessarily have to be valid at the lexing step. Um, all these individual things are called tokens. And as far as the lexer is concerned, it doesn't matter what order it's in. All it cares about is the fact that it can break up all these different individual words. It's almost like a spell check. It doesn't necessarily make sense that your, your uh, code doesn't have to be in any order or make any kind of sense. It just has to pass this lexing step. Uh, for example, this process right here, it still lexes fine, even though it's complete nonsense. JavaScript, it makes no sense, right? Where we actually start to validate our code and make sure it actually functions is that next step. It's called parsing. So parsing is when we look at all that, those tokens that we created the to over the lexing or tokenization process, and it starts to apply semantic meaning to what it is you're, we're trying to do inside of that code. So in this case, we decided we were going to set a variable called sum, assign it to a value of one, and in addition to the number two. That's fantastic, right? It's very pretty straightforward. So it's just the process of taking all those tokens that you created, making sure that the order makes sense and that it can actually have semantic meaning. The computer can understand what the hell you're trying to talk about. And finally, once we have all that stuff, we can do what's uh, the final part, the code generation part. So code generation is taking that logical concept that we created and actually internally creating this thing that's kind of called a, uh, it's a tree-like structure. It's actually usually called an abstract, abstract syntax tree, or AST. And this is the thing that pr uh, powers pretty much any kind of modern transpiler, Webpack, TypeScript, all the modern web tools that you've been using. Babel is a huge thing as well. Uh, all these things ultimately come down to this exact same process. It's this idea of breaking down your code into individual discrete pieces that can be rearranged and then have re new code generated from it. So that's how all that stuff works. It's not really magic. It's just a lot of really close matching over time. So that's how we can take code like this and then turn it into Ruby or vice versa. It seems like it'd be very straightforward and simple, but you end up having to do all kinds of internal processing to make sure it actually works. So now once I could understand how we could take Ruby code or turn it into JavaScript or really just one language and turn it into another, I decided I wanted to try and use Opal to see if I could bring SAS to the web. I wanted to see if I could run the entirety of SAS inside of a web browser. And so I opened up a Ruby file. I had never written Ruby before. This is really my first Ruby project I'd ever done. So I just created a .rb file. Uh, I uh, require Opal, which is, requires just like uh, Node.js requires, just a way to Im import uh, libraries into a file. In this case, we're bringing over the Opal library. We're bringing over the Opal parser as well. Uh, the parser is going to be the thing that scans the uh, SAS file that we end up writing. Keep in mind that the Ruby code that we're creating is really CSS. It's our SAS file. Since that has to get uh, parsed at runtime inside of the browser, we have to include the entirety of the Opal parser so that it can do all the Ruby processing, even though it's really just CSS most of the time, uh, inside our, our file that gets output. Then after that, 
we just uh, import SAS, the actual vanilla SAS library without any modifications, and create a simple function that we're used to expose the idea of building. So this is just a function that takes in a string and a couple of options and then output the file. You know, it takes in the SAS file, outputs CSS. So, you know, it took me about a week to figure this six lines of code out, but I was finally able to do it. And I run it on the command line, and I wait about 10 minutes, and then I come back, and it's, hey, it's done. And there's no errors. I was really, really excited because, you know, it worked, but at the same time, it didn't air out at, at first. And so it's kind of concerning, as I think any time you start a new project, if something just works. So with trepidation, I go and I write some HTML, and I make a really quick test page to see how this file works, and it immediately airs. Can't even use the function, it just airs out immediately, and I'm like, well, crap. And that ended up introducing me to the really, what I like to refer to as the first law of any kind of transpilation work, and that is that it never works. It's, it, well, the first time. This is a really, really complex process. If you think that, like, SAS is a 10-year-old project, Opal's a 7-year-old project, and all these different things, there's a lot of rules uh, and a lot of code, you know, like millions and millions of lines of code are trying to output the hello world inside of CSS at this point in time. And so, unsurprisingly, I kind of have to sand down some rough edges. I have to do some modification in order to make sure it worked. So, uh, I get a dive in and try and make it function. And now, again, I've never written Ruby code before, and so this error, co error message was a little bit concerning. Uh, it says undefined method match size for class and then some other stuff. And I have no real idea what that means. And so I did what I you know, do most of my life when I can't figure something out. I just grep. You know, I just start looking through the code base to figure out whether or not that string, that uh, SAS util multibyte string scanner exists in there, right? Because it's saying that it was trying to access a method on this function class or something. And you know, huzzah, it turns out that that actually does exist in there and it's in one file. And so I open up that file and try and figure out you know, what exactly is going on. And luckily, it's a Ruby project, so it's really well commented. Uh, and it says that it's a wrapper of the native string scanner class. And I don't know what that means, but I do notice that it says native string scanner. It sounds like it was something that was built into Ruby, so maybe it was a problem with Opal. And I dive into the Ruby do uh, documentation, and it turns out that, yes, this is a Ruby documentation. This is a Ruby function that should exist. Turns out Opal just doesn't support it. And so it brings me to my rule two, uh, and that is that tools aren't perfect. Like I said before, both these projects are old, and it just so happens that Opal hadn't got it around to implementing the match size part of that function, mostly because it's a pretty trivial thing that almost no project actually uses. Just so happens that SAS needs to have it. And so, uh, not knowing any Ruby or how Opal really works internally, I decide uh, you know, with a bunch of hubris to jump into that file and find out where string scanner is defined and see if I can patch it in myself. And so we do. We jump into string scanner. It turns out it's only defined in one location. Open that up. And again, I'm immediately lost because I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, but I start to notice a pattern. Uh, a couple of different things are listed there. There's the beginning of line. There's scan. And I remember from the documentation that I just looked at that these are the names of functions inside of Ruby. See, this is a Ruby file, and it looks like every single Ruby thing that it's trying to transpile. So in this case, like string scanner dot beginning of line or string scanner dot scan. These are different names of functions that they're just exposing inside of their own Ruby file. They're basically just monkey patching over it. It's almost like extending the prototype in JavaScript. Script, and what they're doing is returning a string internally. So this is just a string of JavaScript code. So what it is end up happening is they're creating a function. When that function is matched from the original Ruby code, it just replaces it with this inlined JavaScript line of code. So uh, in order to get it to work, I just look up what exactly is match size doing. I create a couple of line uh, pull requests that adds the functionality, have it in my local version. And another week later, it was finally, you know, I got over that uh, hump of the problem. And I get a recompile for the second time. And I dive in. And hey, there's no error this time. And uh, you have no idea how I'm excited I am the fact that I have not had an error. This is a project that has been taking me for a while, and my mind is already feeling like it was melting. And so I get to throw up a little piece of code. This is just the JavaScript that's required to invoke the Opal code to basically output an empty CSS selector using none of the fancy stuff of CSS. I just wanted to return the simple string. And of course, it airs out again <laughs> immediately. Which brings me to rule three of whenever you're working with code transpilation, and that is it's super tedious. It's the exact same little tiny problems over and over and over again, and this happens every time. It never gets easier. There's a, you know, almost every problem is going to be a really tiny, stupid problem, and then you fix it, and then there's 10,000 more, and then eventually it's done, and it's great. But the big takeaway from this uh, tediosity that you experience is that you can simplify whenever you can. 
And so in this particular case, uh, it's trying to call this method called toSim, which is an internal Ruby thing called a symbol. Uh, it turns out that you can't really polyfill that well in JavaScript. And so I ended up needing to patch it inside of the SAS library to use a similar function that we can polyfill that does the exact same thing the way that SAS is doing it. So ultimately, I needed to patch Opal. I need to patch SAS. I need to pa and ultimately, I'll need to uh, patch a whole bunch of gem files and dependencies internally. And I ended up having to make several hundred modifications to all these, pro uh, to all these different projects in order to make it work. All of them are really tiny, but they add up. And so in order to make sure that I can make all these different modifications and do it in a repeatable way so I don't lose it, so I don't all of a sudden get lost and forget how all this stuff works, uh, I end up using a project called Opal Webpack, uh, just an Opal loader for an internal Webpack. Uh, takes a uh, Webpack file, and it's a plugin to understand Opal. It's very, very straightforward and simple. And then I also used a thing called the string replace loader. String replace loader is exactly what it says on the tin. You give it a regex, uh, you give it a string, and it replaces the string with another string. It's the stupidest, simplest Webpack plugin you can possibly write. It's horrible and ugly. And it ended up with me having a configuration file that's several hundred lines long. Um, so I used to crash PowerPoint when I tried to show how long this file was, but it's very, very long. Uh, but ultimately, after all these different modifications to all the different projects had been done, I was able to create OfflineSass.club, which is the most useless website you'll ever use. Uh, you can check it out right now if you go there. Let me see if I can get it working. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Uh, boop. Boop. So cool. Uh, so this is a SAS file on the left-hand side. This is the compiled CSS on the right. You can see if we just change any of this stuff, we can hit compile, and it works. And that happens you know, offline. I'm not connected to the internet. If you look really, really closely, there's no Wi-Fi here. And I was super excited. I know it's a really stupid website, but believe me, my girlfriend was incredibly tired of me talking about how much I hated SAS at this point. Uh, so it was really exciting for everyone involved um, to <laughs> see that you know small little change work. And I felt pretty proud of myself at this point because I'm not the smartest man in the world and I made a thing happen. And so I tweeted out that, you know, you know, like how trying to brag and everything. And I got back, because I have nice friends, immediately how terrible the project was and how it was broken on all their code. And you know, that brings me ultimately to my fourth point, and that is that you should test everything whenever possible. And you know, really, reuse tests whenever possible. See, like I mentioned before, Opal and SAS and all these other projects are uh, Ruby projects. And if you have never been a part of the Ruby community, one thing that they're famous for is having a ridiculous amount of tests. They have test-driven development. And so I was lucky enough to inherit several hundred thousand test assertions internally that I could use to validate that all of my Ruby code was actually still functional, even though inside of JavaScript. The problem is that it was a Ruby test runner. So I ended up having to rewrite every single test inside of JavaScript. Luckily, that was a little bit simpler than rewriting the entirety of SAS into JavaScript, but it still took a really, really long time. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, if I let this scroll for about the next 20 minutes, uh, we ended up having something that worked. And I could run a code, and I ran this, and it just functioned. And I got a full version of SAS running inside of a web worker, inside of all major web browsers. Not only that, because I had used the um, using a string replacer inside of the loader and everything, rather than manually hand editing all these files, um, it generated all 80 versions of SAS. Every single version of SAS that ever existed inside of their GitHub repository could now be automatically generated. It's over seven years, nearly eight years now, actually, of SAS, all done automatically, randomly. I could just run this one command, grunt generate SAS, and then I go take a nap for several hours because it's doing a ridiculous amount of processing, and then all of a sudden, it has everything. Uh, it was awesome. I was super excited. There was one single problem with all this. Uh, can anybody spot what the problem is here? Anybody? I'll give you a hint. It's right there. It's 2.7M on the file size. That's uh, 2.7 megabytes of a SAS file. Now, this is 2.7 megabytes of JavaScript that has nothing to do with your website. Obviously, most people wouldn't ever want to actually use this on the web. The only exclusions would be sites like maybe JSPen or CodePen or these other you know, code scratch pad websites. And that's a crap load of JavaScript to do nothing. That's you know, just the very bare minimum they can have in order to have offline web applications. And even if you compress it with like, uh, what Max mentioned earlier, with like Brotly, one of the most aggressive compression algorithms you can have, you're still under 250K, which is a really, really crappy amount of space to be taking up on a user's machine to do nothing. Uh, and so this is something that is really true of just about all JavaScript transpilation today, is it's, it's huge. It takes up a lot of size. It takes up a lot of space in the, user's, uh, the RAM inside the user's devices. And that's why a lot of the um, standards development inside of JavaScript today is focused on this new thing called WebAssembly. Has anybody here heard of WebAssembly before? 
Awesome. Has anybody here used WebAssembly before? All right. Uh, so in order to under explain what WebAssembly is, we kind of have to go a couple of layers deep. WebAssembly is an extension of this thing called ASM.js. Uh, ASM.js has been around for a while. It was invented by this gentleman right here, Alon. Uh, he's now a researcher at Mozilla, the folks that make Firefox. But previously, uh, he was actually a video game developer. And you see, he blogged about it at the time. Uh, Steve Jobs stood on a stage a uh, number of years ago and basically said that the Flash was never coming to the iPhone. And as a game developer at the time, that's kind of terrifying because Alon had generated this thing right here called Bullet Physics. Uh, this is a video game engine that was being used inside of Flash games, inside of, it's actually won Oscars for movies. It was used in like Lord of the Rings and stuff. And he wanted to bring this to the web but he was expecting to use Flash, and now that Flash was never going to be on the iPhone, it's like, well, crap, I'm not going to re-implement all this, this logic that had been spending, you know, you know, five, ten years at this point uh, working to get it inside of JavaScript again. So he started to rack his brain on how we could actually bring it to the web. He created this project called Emscripten. Now, Emscripten is really, really cool. It's what's called a backend to LLVM. So I mentioned it's several layers deep, but I promise we're near the bottom of the stack on all this stuff. LLVM is used to stand for low-level virtual machine. Now, technically, it doesn't stand for anything. But it is effectively a code compiler, and it's very similar to the code uh, transpilation that we talked about earlier. You know, Opal takes Ruby code and outputs JavaScript. What uh, LLVM does is it takes generally native code, like C++, and then it turns it into this sort of middle state, this byte code. <clears throat> this is LLVM bytecode. That's what it does on what's called its front end. Its front end takes the C code or other, a couple other native languages. And then it has this separate section called backends that can be in, uh, put in there. And then it can generate code for, in, originally, it was intended to generate code for different processors, like your ARM processors, your x86s, et cetera. Uh, but what Alon did is he created a new backend that actually, rather than bytecode, outputted JavaScript. That JavaScript that Emscripten outputs right there, that's ASM. That's ASM.js. And what, so all it is is really just JavaScript, but it's extremely specialized JavaScript. Uh, there's actually a standard for uh, ASM that all browsers implement. It works in all old browsers as well. It works much better in faster browsers. And the reason why it works better in newer, faster browsers is because well, this is what the code looks like. This is the, this is the beautified version of ASM.js. Um, and it's really, really ugly. Don't hurt your eyes trying to read it. It's basically just really specialized JavaScript with a crap load of techniques that code processors, sorry, the JavaScript engines love to read. There's a whole bunch of tricks internally to make the code screaming fast, make it as fast as possible. So this is a, one of my favorite tricks that it has internally. Uh, this is a logical or zero. And so the reason why this is useful, excuse me, is like to look at this uh, fairly straightforward code. Uh, we have x plus 2. If you are a JavaScript engine, you look at this x plus 2, you have to ask yourself, OK, is x a string? In which case, you have to coerce it uh, 2 into a string and then uh, concatenate the two things together. Is it an object? In which case, you have to stringify it and then concatenate again. Is it an integer? In which case, we can just take the two things and actually do logical addition on it. Um, now, with the, XOR, with the logical XOR, what we can do instead is basically say we're going to, f if x is not an integer, it forces it to the number 0. So by saying x equals x logical or 0, it will always be an integer no matter what, because if it's not a number, it gets turned into 0. As a result, we can skip all this questioning, all this logic that we have to check internally inside of the browser engine. So it becomes much, much faster. It can make all these, uh, the pre-look-ahead parsers can look at all these problems and start to notice all these patterns that it's using, and your code just screams. It goes really, really fast. So that's ASM.js. It's been around for a number of years, and there's been a number of projects that have been built uh, using it, and a lot of things that were originally native code has been brought to the web as a result of it. We have stuff like uh, SQL.js, which is really cool. It's literally the entirety of SQL. You can run that inside of a JavaScript web worker or anything if you want to have an entire SQL interpreter. Uh, we have, let me see if I can pull up my more fun examples compared to SQL. Do, 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 do. Yeah, OK, so this is uh, quakejs.com. You can have a full death match inside of the browser. This actually works over WebRTC. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, it's incredibly fast. And this is the C program running inside of JavaScript inside of the browser. Uh, it actually, I, I muted it, and I can't have out sound output, but you have the full experience. And then probably my, fav my favorite JavaScript hack is actually uh, Windows 95. So this is a full version of Windows 95 running inside of a browser. Uh, usually, I can get Internet Explorer to launch, but I don't want to risk it on top of the stage. So I'll just launch Solitaire. But um, it is a full version of a web operating system running inside of a JavaScript engine inside of another browser. 
all running on top of ASM.js. ASM and you can see it's running at basically as fast as Windows 95 was ever intended to run. Like, it's, it's not necessarily the fastest thing in the world, but it runs really, really well. And that's because of all of these internal um, optimizations that the browser engine is able to, to, to make. Excuse me. So now we can skip ahead. And so that all was ASM.js, right? But we were really talking about WebAssembly, the future of uh, JavaScript and the future of what a lot of browser engines are looking to for what the web development might look like in the next few years. Uh, and so you might be asking, OK, what's the difference between <coughs> ASM and WebAssembly? And so keep in mind that ASM is really just JavaScript under the covers. Uh, so that means that you still have to lec you still have to download the entirety of your JavaScript file. It has to lex it, then parse it, then do code generation. What WebAssembly is, is a binary version of the generated code. And so basically, you can skip the lexing and the parsing and the code generation and then just immediately boot to the exact state that would happen at the end of all that. So it's just new binary format for the web. That just means that you'll be able to have all these code that's being transpiled to the web that much faster. And this is something that's actually being leveraged already. There's a number of major websites already using uh, WebAssembly. Uh, there's uh, Wikipedia, for example. The Wikimedia group uh, requires that all of their content, like uh, videos and audio files, have to be in an open codec, uh, which basically just means Opus uh, or Ogvorbis on their uh, web sites. And they, that is not a codec that's supported in all major browsers, including Edge. Uh, we don't currently support it. And so they created the AugV library, which is a uh, JavaScript and WebAssembly-based version of a audio and video codec. So if you ever play an audio or video file on uh, Wikipedia, you're actually going through a JavaScript codec. It's playing video at 60 frames a second with full fidelity audio in JavaScript. It's phenomenal. Not only that, probably my favorite example of stuff that's using ASM and WebAssembly. Uh, Facebook, I assume most people are familiar with Facebook. Um, one thing I noticed a little while ago when I went to post a photo, <clears throat> when I opened the new post uh, thing and I opened up DevTools, I noticed this weird uh, JavaScript file that was only being fetched once I go to post a uh, image. So I start digging into that file and I noticed that it has this internal comment where it's provide modules libjpeg. And libjpeg is the JPEG library that is used everywhere. It's a C file. It's how they end up using JPEG. Uh, basically anywhere that you ever use JPEG on a computer. What's happening is uh, Facebook is actually noticing if you start to upload a file that's particularly large, like if you use a camera and try to upload a raw image or a 50 megapixel image or something, and it will actually, in a web worker, resize your photo using libjpeg inside of a web worker before it uploads that file. So they're using C code that has been existing for 40 years at this point, 35 years, uh, inside of a web worker today in production to their billions of users that exist. They're already doing this now. It, it's, it's becoming incredibly easy to start shipping these uh, ASM and uh, WebAssembly-based products on major websites today that you've probably already used without even realizing it. And so I encourage everyone here to check out and start to look at these projects that have existed for a really long time. How can you leverage them inside of your own web projects? There's a uh, thing from the Firefox team that's phenomenal called WASM pack, where you can actually use it to bring uh, Rust applications into the web really, really easily. Uh, it's a really great start for WebAssembly if you have any interest in doing native programming. But more and more libraries are starting to just publish their own WebAssembly versions. So ultimately, that all brings me to my fifth and final point for uh, dealing with any type of code transpilation, and that's just try something dumb. Uh, it's really fun to do stupid stuff on the internet, including uh, learning how transpilation works or getting SAS to work inside of a browser. So ultimately, try it out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and thanks. My name is Patrick. You can find me pretty much anywhere. It's been a pleasure.